So after an uh, incredibly moving morning, and thanks to the survivors who accepted to speak, because as we know, it's very difficult to speak about the horror that you have lived, especially when you keep on living on it for years and years after. I think it is Simone Veil who died in France uh, recently, and she, she was in Auschwitz, uh, and she said that she thought that the, death, the day of her death, she would think of Auschwitz dying. So, uh, you know, as the Bember Foundation has shown, the, 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 the similarities between the Holocaust and what happens to survivors of human trafficking are really big. And so I thank, you, I thank all of them a lot. And of course, all our keynote speakers. So now, we are going to see all the scholars. You know, this is this, is this tradition at a Trust Conference that we bring from uh, the front line 60 CEOs or um, uh, people important in NGOs that are in the front line and who could never afford the ticket and the, and, 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 and the travel and, and the hotel. So thanks to our sponsor, uh, we, can, we can have them here. So I will ask all the scholars to come on stage and there are 60 of them. Uh, we, we don't want this, um, this um, uh, uh, conference to be uh, exclusive. It is very inclusive. And, and we also don't want these discussions we have to respect, to, to respect only the Western perspectives. This is why you had so many people from different places uh, this morning. So it's an opportunity for all the frontline activists to join us from their respective countries to share their stories to meet other people. One of them told me last year that he had met two board members. He, he created two board members for his organization at this conference, which is really nice. Um, and, and we are able to do that through the scholarships. So, so the, the, this program, every year, we put on Facebook that we are going to give, I don't know, in May or June, that we are going to uh, have uh, scholarships at the conference, be a candidate. And this year we received 4,000 candidacies. So 4,000 wanted to be here. It would have been uh, too small for them, but we chose 60, and among the 60, they are really 60 of the best among all the, um, the ones who explain why they want to be here. So uh, they, 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 they are coming from 50 different countries, including South Africa, Nigeria, Uganda, Malawi, South Sudan, Iraq, Kazakhstan, Mongolia, Nepal, India, Pakistan, Samoa, and many, many more. All of them are doing extraordinary things in their country, so you will recognize their badge, and then you can speak to them whenever you want. So, are you coming? <laughs> I don't want to be alone on stage. Don't be shy, eh? Amy, Amy.
Our ancestors built our bodies from soil in the creases of their hands. We were loyal, not to the men in our lives, but to the desert clay in our bones. This is who we were, fire wrapped in faded skin, children of grandmothers, mothers of kings, until the day our brethren fell. When the last breath is taken, flesh turns. The colors of life that leave the body are the names we ascribe to our fears. We see rainbows everywhere. The irony of fire is that your eyes go last. Long after you can no longer feel its sting, you can still see it burn. In death, all our eyes are gray. They mimic the hues of smoke that dance across the sky. There are no instructions for dealing with death. When the militia opened fire in Al Fashir, we saw gold stars fall from the sky, land on every cornerstone until the buildings began to melt. They poured lead from a broken chalice, silver kerosene, crimson flames, ivory when the sun hits bone at high noon, burgundy when blood dries, it chips as if it's trying to escape back into a body. I can never forget how much death loves my people, the way they fall asleep at its feet, burgundy blankets, burgundy pillows, but our tears are colorless. There is no hue to shade this pain. Eleven days ago, two bullets crossed off two more faces from my family tree. They were 14, they were studying, the blood-soaked arithmetic pages are still sitting on the mantle. My uncle won't throw them away. I can't tell you what death looks like, but when he came, he stayed. We held one funeral for two brothers. The misshapen grooves of a once body bend the light so their caskets were closed. Coffins made heavy by the weight of two bullets. My brother is 15, learning to carry our dead. His legs buckle under the weight of his pedigree. My father says, stand up straight. You think this is hard? Try carrying the living. And we never hire grave diggers anymore. Now the soil feels so familiar under my hands. I've gathered enough to build a body, but I'm afraid of what I'll make. I'm afraid to write this bloodline into something that I'll love. This pain is encoded. Our genes come to fruition on our skin. It is in burgundy. It's black. And I wake up every morning wondering when they'll come for me. I want to spill every color from this form. I want to leave a canvas sinking with the weight of my pedigree. I want to be able to look at a sunrise and not see my entire family falling to pieces. I wish the skin had come with instructions. When the last breath is taken, flesh turns. And for the past 24 years, I've seen rainbows everywhere. Thank you. A little bit hard to. My cousins uh, that I talked about in that poem, they were killed almost three years ago now. And when I think about them, I think about what they were doing. They were studying. They were in high school, just starting. A lot of different paths ahead of them. I also think about where they were and not just what they were doing. They were in Niala, in Darfur. That also put them at a very intense level of risk. They were young. They were not very wealthy, and they were in a place that was incredibly dangerous. Their skin, their age, their, their country they were born in, everything about them put them at different kinds of risks. People who are at risk are seldom ever at risk in only one way. I can't really think of anyone who is ever facing just one problem at a time, which is why I think it's fascinating how in the world we see today, when you look at how power thinks about problems, it compartmentalizes it. It looks at refugee problems as refugee problems, women's problems as women's issues, um, trafficking problems as trafficking issues. It tries to compartmentalize humanity in a way that doesn't make sense. It's completely counterintuitive, which is why I always try to talk about putting people back in front of the numbers and putting our humanity back in front of what it is we're working for. When I think about my cousins, I think about the different places they could have ended up. College, job, on this stage, speaking, or at the same time, they could have ended up trafficked because that's what happens in Sudan. It terrifies me because at a moment when someone is pointing a gun at you, they can do many different things. In the moment for my cousins, they chose to kill them, but they could have taken them. They could have done more. A lot of things that happen in Sudan till this day, and in a lot of other countries. 
So why is it important to talk about it? Why is it important to talk across fields and together like this? Because we bring people into the room that can't always be in the room. I think it's crucial that you're all here, but I also think it's important to not stop when you leave. It's incredible what the trust is doing by bringing people who are actually at the front of the struggle into the room physically. But when you go to other places, the person sitting next to you in the chair right now with you, can't you can't necessarily bring them everywhere with you, right? Everyone here, you have your own circles and your own specific seats that you occupy, not literally in this room right now, but you can't bring everyone into the room, except you can with your work and my remembering what you're hearing here today. I think that we can change the way that we approach conflict resolution and that we approach problems in this world if we think about people. And that's why I want to share this next poem with you called Bird Watching on Lesbos Island. It was, uh, when I went to Lesbos Island, it was at the front of all of the refugees coming from Turkey across the Mediterranean and the boats and everything. And I'm sure you've heard of it, but what I saw there was an incredible kind of collaboration that I don't always see anywhere else in the world. And I think that's exactly the kind of world we need to work toward. The problems that we see in the world today didn't happen overnight, so they're not going to be solved overnight. And they're not the fault of one person, so it's not going to be solved by one person. We need all hands on deck and an incredibly continued, sustained effort, which is what this next poem is about. And then I'll leave you. <laughs> um, the only other thing that I want to say is it is hard to talk about this and it's hard to respond to it when you think about everything that a person is going through but you can't necessarily change everything that happened before but you can change every step from here forward and that's what I want you to be thinking about from now on okay bird watching on Lesbos Island I hope that made sense <laughs> I met a woman, her mother and her son, all under the subtle shade of a tent. Three generations of one family held together in a morsel of time. The life of a refugee is counted in moments. In this moment, we were bird watching on Lesbos Island, the sun melting the clouds across our vision as the first bird spiraled brilliantly toward the Aegean shore. To go from bird watching to boat watching in Greece is to witness the world unfurl. I was told of days when the birds came in hordes, broken winged and heaving, spilling forth 50 to 80 hatchlings at a time, each broken shell another person seeking rest. Box-figured crows, floating rubber albatrosses hug the horizon in the bitter cold. When an island becomes a door, who will answer? If enough eyes see a body in the water and no hands reach out to rescue her, did she really die? This time, when this world left children to take their first steps at the edge of humanity. When the seams broke and the threads lay society bare, the eyes came and the helping hands followed. Imagine people carrying people on their backs. Imagine shores covered in footprints and wheelchair tracks, the passion it takes to swallow the wind, kiss the October sea and meet the boats. I've seen how paperwork can divide families, separating mother and father with the stroke of a pen. How firm handshakes can unravel entire nations when the stage is big enough if I had the power, I would have paper mache those contracts, lined the ceilings with paper cup lights. I would have painted the walls cerulean so even the smallest of palms could reach for the sky. I would have lined entire rooms with books, covered kitchens with the warmest pies. I would have counterfeited camps with chalk to build a home, to build a refuge, to bring the dignity back into a concrete oasis. I would have built a camp that is a call to prayer where a person who's carried in can leave walking. This is what I saw on Lesbos Island. Because when a child is born in a context of war, this is how you unveil the world to them, how you unravel music to their ears. I've stood on both sides now, and I can tell you that in Lesbos, the cats are brown with white spots because a child's painting told me so. The life jacket bags are in style because a boy named Suhaib showed me so. And that a village can all stand together when a woman wills it so. Safe passage begins with asking the questions no one will dare to utter and becoming the answer no one could possibly imagine.
Thank you. Thank you. Well, for the ones who didn't hear Amy this morning, this is Amy Mahmoud, and she's a, a renowned poet. And I forgot to tell you that uh, in uh, January, she is going to do a peace walk across Sudan for 40 days. So if you are interested to join her, you can. 